Welcome to The Next Journey, the adventure travel podcast with me, Andrew St. Pierre White. I'm a prisoner of Welcome to, to The Next Journey podcast. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's Friday afternoon, and my special guest is my good, close friend, Heiner Klarman, and it's Friday afternoon. It is Friday afternoon. So Cheers. So we're, Cheers, both, we're both having a, a, a beer together. Mm. So it is like a normal Friday. We could just meet, have a beer, but you yes. know, we share it with people. Yes. So now I wanted to talk to you about something that pe people don't know about you. Okay. And, and that is... And while I thank our sponsors, I'm going to ask you because I have, <laughs> I have not, I have not briefed Heiner. No, I got no mind. idea what we talk about. And that is life inside a motoring car maker with product development and research and development that you were involved with, yeah. with Volkswagen yes. for some years. I, I was actually, yeah. And you have spoken to me uh, on several occasions yeah. about your experiences yeah. there. But they've always been in little sound bites around that's the true. campfire. Yes, that's right, yeah. So I'm going to come back to you now and <laughs> we're going to have some fun with that. Cool. I'd like to thank our sponsors uh, today, which are Zippo. Did you know that Zippo don't just make lighters? They make those lovely lighters brass lighters that you hold in your hands and they're very tactile. They're, 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 there's something ritualistic about using a Zippo, particularly if you're lighting a campfire. But they also make inserts that allow you to now light your campfire or whatever with a butane flame. Try it. It's a, it's a game changer. Suddenly now, I'm now lighting my campfires, not with a match or even with a lighter, but I'm using a little Zippo butane flame. And these were introduced to me by Harry from Fire to Fork. Thank you, Harry. They're wonderful. They even make natural fire lighters. So check out their products on, on the website. Um, they are still made in the USA, which I quite like. Anyway, thank you to them. Heiner. Mm, I've got one of those ones from Harry. They actually work really well. Have you got, yeah. you like them too? I'm yeah. hooked. They I'm completely awesome. hooked. Yeah. Yeah. And you can refill them and, and it's like a Zippo lighter, but just better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. It's fantastic. C can we curse in this thing? Swear, cursing, or do you beep us out? I, okay, well, if you want, if you want to, if you want to curse, if you want to swear, then I would say this is a warning to you. There are probably going to be some, which looks, let, let me put it this way. If you're going to swear and curse, it means the story is going to be a good one. <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> then I don't have to hold back. Give me a little bit of a background. You were where and when? Mm -hmm. I did my final year project from my uh, university course. I studied automotive mechatronics engineering. And uh, for my final year project, I applied for a position at VW in Wolfsburg in Germany. That's their headquarters. And they've got their engine development over there as well. And I was part of a PhD program. So there was a guy that did a PhD and he had two final year projects going on as part of his PhD thesis in the exhaust after treatment department. And I was part of that in 2007. Right. And your responsibilities were? My responsibility was to uh, design a control algorithm that would uh, <laughs> allow... <coughs> The overall program that was running in the ECU to do a after uh, ah, what do you call it again in English uh, after exhaust gas treatment basically burn off a DPF but without uh, extra injector which was used back in the days because DPF technology was just new back then uh, it was just done with the normal combustion cycle and uh, a software algorithm was needed for that. So you were there during the debacle that I don't know a lot about. I probably know the average amount. Yeah. You know, they got caught yes. fudging emission emissions. They, they made claims that were not they were unable to substantiate in Absolutely. terms of emission control. So you're talking about the emissions of these vehicles. 
I do, and I actually work with those people that were later made responsible or not responsible, depending on who you ask. But it was exactly that department that I worked in. I've actually had, while I was in Australia, years later, you know, when everything came out, I've had people from Wall Street Journal, actually, they found me and they called me and they asked me if they could interview me over the phone about this. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. What kind of questions were they asking? They were asking who I worked with, uh, if I knew anything what was happening, what the equipment was we worked with, what the overall company policies were, what the what the whole vibe at the company was, all that sort of stuff. They they asked me plenty of questions. I think I had a one, one and a half hour interview over the phone with one of the guys. I can't remember who it was, but he set up an interview. He called me and then uh, asked me a lot of questions. I haven't seen anything from it anywhere, but I think it was back in those days when they tried to get all that info together about what actually happened and how VW did their as you call it, fudging with the emissions, which they definitely did. And what was what was their? You think they were after information, or the? Do you think they were after scandal? Both. I mean, they were after information to make sure they've got a great scandal on hand. I'm pretty sure that's what they were after back in those days. And I mean, they found everything. Uh, as as far as I remember, that they found everything that they could about what was happening there. And uh, my involvement with VW when I was there was, it was not a great company culture. I felt very alien in that company and I was treated as such as well. It was very much people against people. Everybody tried to be the best. People were stepping on other people. The equipment was rubbish that we worked with, uh, like really old computers and it was not a great company. And when everything came out, I was not surprised back in the days that that happened. Did, any, did anybody actually point fingers at you as being responsible? Or was it just your bosses or, or their now, bosses? I was not even aware that anything like that was happening. I mean, I was the guy that worked for the guy that was doing his PhD, who then worked for the people that actually worked at VW. So you have to think about it like that VW has got a research project going on. So they get a PhD student, somebody who wants to do his PhD and say like, hey, this is what we want to research. You know, work yourself into the field. Those people usually got three to five years to do their PhD on that particular topic. And then those PhD people will actually say like, okay, this is my overall field. There's a little subfield. There's another little subfield. I actually get people that do their engineering degree to help me with those. And I was one of those people. Were you, though, actually, in, did, did you smell a rat? Did you see what was going on? Not at all. Not at all? Nothing. There would have only really been maybe a handful of people or so that would actually know. But after I've heard about all of that, I wasn't surprised because the people over there, they were trying really hard to make things work with what they had which was not a great deal. So the equipment that they had and the pressure that was on them to design things and develop things was quite high. And I think eventually it was just too much and they went like, well, we still have to keep our jobs somehow. We have to actually reach our goals, but we don't know how, so let's do that. Would you? I mean, I don't know that. that. That is just a claim, if you know what I mean, but it would make sense to me that that's how all of that happened. Would you buy a Volkswagen? No. Why not? They're just not great quality cars. They're made to last a certain amount of time and then they just break. If you look at a VW Amarok, they are not really a great, reliable car. You know, VW actually puts uh, uh, covers underneath the cars that are able to soak up the oil. So I know from VW <laughs> mechanics that there's so much oil allowed to actually soak out of the engine and into the uh, noise dampening underneath the vehicle and they just clean them out. It's, but it's VW, Mercedes, it's roughly the same. The, the high standards of German automotive manufacturing has deteriorated over the decades because back in the days, I think automotive design in Germany was run by engineers. 
and they are trying to build great products. Yes. But eventually that has changed and people that were mainly studying uh, how to run a company or be a lawyer or something like that, they've taken over all these companies and it was all about profit in those companies. And the product just deteriorated because they just tried to shave off production cost wherever they could. And a once really great product deteriorated to a really average product that will do what it's just promising to do and then fall into bits, I think. Is that not true, though, of I mean, not even motor, all motor companies? Look at the story with Boeing. When Boeing and McDonnell Same. Douglas merged, yeah. McDonnell Douglas's ethos was money, 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 money. Yeah. Boeing's ethos was pride, pride, pride. And of course, the shareholders too. Mm. But it was driven by pride. Yeah. And look what happened. And uh, Mercedes-Benz used to be the stalwart motor car. I mean, they, 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 that was the car that everybody was judged with Mercedes-Benz at the top of the heap. Yeah, that was the benchmark. That, that, was, that was, if you wanted to build a car, it's like, well, that's what Mercedes does. That's yes. what you can achieve, but you can't really do more. That's like the, that's the top of the Which top. is absolutely not the case anymore. No, totally not. I mean, really not. Really, really it, not. Really, really not. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the old 123 or 124 series, that's probably still driving around in Africa with millions of kilometers mm. on there. You know, the, mm. the taxis, mm. basically. Mm. They are brilliant cars. They will mm. probably still run there for another 10, 20 and years. before that, Peugeot's in Africa. Peugeot 504s. 404s and 504s. Yeah. Still running. Really? Because they were built... They were built properly. Yeah. Not built for, for shareholders. Yeah. Yeah. Except for the design. No, but no, you have to be French to like that. No, I think. No, yeah, yeah, you have to be French to like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I, w I was hoping to get some juicy stuff from you um, with regards to working with Volkswagen. But obviously it's not. It's the, you, you have really n nothing juicy to add to this. To no, to this not story. really. Because, I mean, I was the, the smallest, the, the smallest cock and the whole cock gearbox, the whole, if you know what I mean. I know. It's like I would just go in there, do my thing, do my little piece of research, yeah. and then at the end present yeah. that to the guys at yeah. VW, and that was the end. Because I like Volkswagen, but I would never buy one mm. because I fundamentally don't trust them. Because if they were cheating on the, e the, the uh, uh, emissions, were they cheating on, I don't know, the brakes, <laughs> the safety? I, mean, I know, you know what you I, ha I have that. I have a question. Yeah, but then really, I'm not sure if you can remember, but back in those days, once it came out with VW, everybody was under the microscope. And I think a lot of other companies sort of made sure that they weren't found out because I think everybody was doing something. Yes. Can, can you still remember the reports back in the days? They were onto Mercedes, they were onto BMW, yes. I think other manufacturers as well. And they must have all got quite scared. I think they did. I'm not sure if they all cheated like that as well, but everybody tries to get around that emission problem somehow. You know, the whole test cycles that they do just for the paper, they take the mirrors off. The tank will have just enough fuel to do that one round. It's like all this sort of stuff, which is not officially cheating, but it's still cheating because you will never drive your car like that. No, one can. it is impossible to reach the manufacturer's suggested fuel consumption for a car it's just not possible yeah you know but i suppose if they're all doing it then you can compare one with the other and you're getting a reasonably fair That's comparison true. yeah comparison after you left volkswagen you obviously that was in in germany yeah and then you came to australia but you came to australia uh as a a, a vagrant wandering hippie Man, yeah can i can, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did just travel around for two and a half years. And my last job in Germany was working as an engineer. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't stand sitting in an office anymore. I was so sick and tired of just designing things on a screen. I was always more a hands-on person. And when I traveled around together with Verena in Australia, I found that there's really good paying jobs as auto electricians. And since I had my trade qualification from before I actually went to uni. I started working as an auto electrician again, here and there, while traveling around. 
and then slowly got into all of that. That's how I got into building four-wheel drives as well, because I never had a four-wheel drive before I came to Australia. I didn't even know what a transfer gearbox was. Oh, okay. What year was that approximately? 2010. Okay, yes, I'm sorry, That's, I'm showing my age now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And your first four-wheel drive was a Nissan? Yeah, a Nissan uh, Patrol from Nissan, 1980. 1980. Yeah, it was an MQ Patrol. And I bought it because it was built the same year that I was built. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so also quite tatty and rattly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I picked it up for three grand. It had an ARB bull bar on it that still had stamped ARB into it, you know, with those hammer stamp sort of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think it must have been some of their very first production stuff that they would have made. And you toured all the way around Australia? Not all the way around. Uh, we went from a lot through Queensland, a lot through the Kimberleys, and then we had one big trip from Byron Bay all the way through Queensland outback, through the top of Australia and then down to Perth. But I've never seen anything south of Sydney or east of Esperance. All that bit in between is still blank map for me. So you were, you were, you were touring, you had your ticket for, for doing auto sparky work, Yeah. but you weren't a mechatronics engineer at that stage. That's right. I still, I'm still not officially a mechatronics engineer. So when I uh, emigrated to, I immigrated to Australia, uh, I applied uh, for an electronics engineer visa. So there was a sh priority short skills list, and electronics engineers were on there. And mechatronics engineers were a subcategory of electronics engineers. But I'm still not officially an electronics engineer. I'm only an electronics engineer for migration purposes. Don't ask me how that works. Okay. But that's the official version. All right. But you, I mean, you're, 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 it's obvious that your knowledge goes far beyond auto sparky. Yes. I mean, you're quite, you, you're actually quite specialized now. I, I am. As I, when I did my auto sparky apprenticeship, I did like the work. But I'd never, I never understood what was happening with these black boxes that I was just changing out that then went into the bin. So I opened them up and I saw all these electronic circuits in there and the little black things with the silver feet on them. And I just wanted to understand what was happening inside there. That's when I went back to school, studied and actually learned electronics. I worked as an embedded software engineer. I worked as an electronics engineer designing electronics designing algorithms, and then I went back to working as an auto electrician. So I think my advantage is I do know the auto electrics work, but I also know how the things work in detail that I'm installing or try to repair. I first met you, I was building my green troop carrier, it would have been in, 18, I think 2018. I was doing some modifications and adding a solar panel to my green troop carrier. Yeah. And you were milling around quick pitch, which was a hive of activity in those days. And now it's not at all. I think I don't even know if they're still That's open. True. A lot happened there. A lot happened. And you came and for some reason you said, I'll install that for you. I mm. don't know why you even offered to install it for you. But you were suddenly part of the scene. Yeah. And I did not even know who you were. By that stage, I still thought YouTube was just for funny cats and dog videos. I never really paid any attention to YouTube That's at the, all. <laughs> that is the trouble with YouTube. <laughs> it is good for cats falling off roofs. Yeah, it as is. As well as, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I remember clearly the the, the, the moment that I, 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 I was do, doing some building of four-wheel drives for clients, and I had just reopened Autograph, and I had built a 76 series, Yes. For a German couple that wanted to leave it here and they insisted on a 76 series. They insisted on a, a rooftop tent that I, I really didn't like, but I they were that. a bit traditional, put it stuck in their ways. And hey, who am I going to say, you know, don't do that. Mm. But he's still, he's, he's one of the few people <clears throat> who've the autograph clients that still contacts me every time he gets back from a trip saying he loves his car. Yeah, I've and seen him a few times. After. You've seen Peter a few yeah. times, a few times. 
and you you had ins I had said to you, okay, this is the installation, this is the what we're going to fit, and you said, no, no, that's fine, and you built an electric box. Yeah. And I remember opening it, and it was very nicely done, but man, it was busy in there. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> you know, and then I said to you, can't you streamline this so that it actually can be speed up the process of the installation of wiring that you did. And you wanted to export it to the USA. You said, I want to build vehicles in the US. I need a system that I can take from Australia to the US. Is that what I said? Yeah, that was. I think that was a plan that you had. I mean, it never really... No, I was. I have lots of plans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't go through with it because it would have been wrong. But that was the kernel. And then I said... I said something like, you know, can we not compact this? And you said, I've already got the drawings for that. That yeah. what you've just described, I've got some drawings. <laughs> and that was the that was the that was the, the birth of Egon. Yeah, yeah, that that was the the first DC hub. That was the very the first DC hub. Because I did I got the idea from working as an auto electrician on mine size, because I worked on some equipment. Uh, they're called surface miners. They're, they're massive machine that gets imported to Australia from Germany, and they put it into the Pilbara. It's a two thousand horsepower engine in it, a four point two meter wide drum. They put it into the ground and just drive it forward and just mill the ground up so they can get the iron ore out. And the older versions had a cabinet two meter by one meter filled up with DIN rails, cables everywhere, everything connected, manually put together, relays everywhere, switches. About three weeks to build one of these boxes and get it right. And we had to rewire one once. It was was an absolute nightmare. And then the newer versions came out and they had a circuit board. And just a lot of plugs that went to a circuit board was half the size and it took half a day if you wanted to change it. And that's where I got the idea from the DC hub from, because I was doing the same thing over and over and over again. Because this one part that we do, the fuse box, is always the same. It always repeats itself. And I was like, man, if we do the same thing that they've done for these construction machines, it'll be so much easier, so much more. So yeah, that's when I said, I've got the idea, because I always try to save some time with the installations, because yeah. it's just me by myself back then. So the DC hub was born, but basically it was just solving the challenge of doing the same thing again and again and again. There are commonalities with every single trailer, every single uh, caravan, camper, four-wheel drive. There is one or two things that are, you do every single time. Every time. Well, now it's, you just bolt it in and you've done it. Yeah. So instead of having to do that stuff, yeah. sounds, this whole thing sounds like it's turned into a sales pitch for Egon. Yeah, I know. We, we, well, we, and we really did not plan this, but no, no. It's Andrew, <laughs> I, I take I, I take full responsibility for this. Yeah, because that's actually that's actually how it happened. And then we we built the first one and we started testing it. And I think I put it in my I put it in my Dream Tourer. As a no, prototype. you didn't have a DC hub in the Dream Tourer. Ah, uh, I did. You did no. In the Dream Tourer. You didn't have a DC did, hub. I, I had a DC hub in the Dream Tourer. You did. Mm -hmm. Definitely. In fact, it was between the seats and we talked about putting a light ah, in it. inside. You didn't have one in the back. Yet. Not in the, yeah, yeah, in, in the, the cab, that's right. In, in the cab. That was yeah. one of the prototypes. Yeah. And then um, and we tried to break it and then we set fire to it again. And eventually we did actually destroy it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, but then it fixed itself again. Well, that was funny when it actually caught fire and was ridiculous. <laughs> How many amps were we putting to, through to? Over, it was well over 200 amps. It was or, over 200, just over, I think, 220, yeah. 230 or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, for quite a long period of time. Mm. And it and it eventually caught fire. We put it out with a fire extinguisher and we were kind of wrapping up. And I said, hey, wait, see if it still works. still worked. Yeah. It was, okay, the voltage drop is a bit of a problem, but it still, <laughs> but it still, still did its thing. It's right. In your business now, I wanted you. You have uh, the the reason why I stopped doing autograph. Yeah, I've never let this know, be known publicly. Was that? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I am terrible with clients. I am so impatient with them. They would they would bring me on board because why? Well, hopefully 
the reason, the good reason for me to be there to help them build their cars because I've got a lot of experience. Yeah. And they're going to listen to me. They but they have, didn't. Well, the, the, the happy clients, like Peter, happy client, typical happy client. There weren't that many of them, but there were some of them. They were just, there was a guy in, in Queensland, um, uh, he, he, the blue one. I would call him up in the middle of the build and say, I've got a decision to make here, and this is the thing that and he would say, whatever. Uh, okay, fine. Be and he had employed me for the right reason, and he's, mm. he's the other guy that sends me pictures every now and again, and he just loves his trip carrier. Yeah. And those that didn't do that and argued with me, and that's when I would get very, very frustrated, as you well know. Yeah. You, you saw a few. <laughs> yeah, we had a few encounters we had with a, some of your customers. We are. You, you must have a lot of those encounters, but you are far calmer, more level-headed than I could ever be, and that's why I stopped doing it. Yeah. Um, because it would it would be too frustrating for me, because I would I would I'd say why are you bringing me on board if you're not going to listen to me? It it wasn't that they weren't they didn't have to listen to everything that I said and agree with me. That was not it. Mm. They were doing things that were so fundamentally bad. Yeah. About the car. You know, they, they, they would have 400 amp hour battery in there. Meanwhile, actually, they were rarely ever going to use more than 100. And I would say, do you really want 400? Surely, no, they want 400. It almost sounds they, like your troopy that you got right now. Well, it's over. My, my trippy is the only reason why it's got that much amperage is because of the induction cooking. Yeah. Only reason. I don't need it. I actually don't need it for the induction cooking. I need it for the capacity of the batteries to deliver enough current to run two induction cookers yes. simultaneously. So it's not so much capacity as the current that the uh, mm. lithiums can deliver. But tell me some stories. Tell me some juicy stories. No name, mm. no pactrol, just some juicy stories where clients asked for the most ridiculous thing and you just had oh, to God, shake it. I really have to think about that. I mean, I get that a lot. And I do encounter that with saying, it's your build, you do what you think is right, I'll just give you advice. And if you're saying, I want something ridiculous, I'll say, me personally, I would not do that, but hey, it's your car, if you want me to do that, I will do it, but if we have to fix it later, you'll have to pay me to fix it later. So either way, you know, you can have it your way. But if it was me, I would do it that way. And you know what? Quite often, uh, things just fall into place in the right way because the customer actually goes away with all the information. And when they come back, they go like, well, I thought this through and I actually think you, uh, you're right with what you do there. So let's do it that way. So I very rarely get that customers want really ridiculous things in their vehicles. It's, uh, it doesn't happen very often, to be quite honest. Right. I, 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 can, I, I think it probably doesn't happen that often because you're level-headed and calm with them. But you're right, it's their money. They can spend it exactly how they want to. And I, and I would try and do exactly the same. Yeah. But, excuse me, the beer's making me burp. <laughs> It would. I remember one. He wanted the they were the, 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 in the interior configuration. Mm. I'd said weaknesses of the troopy. His first troopy. These are some of the weaknesses. Here's some of the strengths. Here's some of the weaknesses. Here's a way of solving this weakness. Yeah. I want uh, and and the client was in in uh, California. His name was uh, Graham. One of the better clients, mind you. And I'm still in contact with Graham. You, yeah, nice guy. Yeah. And we built that trippy for him. And I said, you know that little thing behind that place behind the passenger seat? Leave it open. Because if you leave it open, you can put tall things in and white things in. And it just, it's versatile. Mm. He had fallen in love with the look of the checkerboard plate, the, 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 the black, the black, I can't remember what it's called, that material is called, but it looks really good. It's got a very, very nice look about it. And he had fallen in love with the pictures I'd sent him. Yeah. And so I thought to myself, stop sending him such nice pictures. <laughs> okay, because it's actually not helping him. Yeah. And he said, no, I want it longer, I want it longer, I want it longer, I want it longer. And then kind of went behind my back and actually with the suppliers that were actually building it and got it longer. Yeah. And he came from California and I remember him arriving and he looked at the vehicle with this enormous smile on his face. And he was a ha he was a happy man. This was a happy man. And it was a beautiful uh, sandy top troop carrier 
with black a kind of black waistband wrap just on the on the bottom and it looked drop dead gorgeous yeah one of the best we've ever made he climbed inside and i didn't say anything but he climbed inside and we had put the the, the board full length and i he looked turned around and looked at me and went oh yeah now i understand now i understand <laughs> so i pulled him aside after all of the hubbub and i said graham we can fix it at 40 minutes we can sort it really mm. we just take the top off we have to cut it trim it 40 minutes the guys will do it don't let it worry you do you want me to do it and the only reason why i think i think i i don't know but i think that he said no is because he was a little embarrassed because <laughs> i had really said to him please don't do it yeah you know if you were here sitting with me you're not you're in california you'd agree with me you'd say yeah, you're right. Because I am actually giving you a good reason for this particular choice. Mm. So uh, that wasn't what actually finally made me give it up. I think the f what finally made me give it up was was um, was one or two things that Rob and I did. Client said, "No, I want this," and I said, "I don't think it's necessary." So I had a little bit of a thing with him, and I said, "You know something? I'm going to let me speak to Rob because I don't actually have a solution for you." And I went to a good old Robbie, and Robbie said to me leave it with me and he put a extra thing in with a hinge and a thing that you could remove and s brilliant just i hadn't thought of it because mm. i'm not a carpenter yeah and he'd come up with a solution and when the client came not a comment not a comment and he started whinging about minor little things like tiny little insignificant things and I, and I <laughs> yeah, said I, to I him, you. Have, you, have you noticed what we did with the bench? It solves your problem and it solved my problem. Now you've got the best of both. Mm. It's, but you can literally choose which way to go, which was courtesy of Rob's brains. Yeah, because he spent the time, spent another night at the factory, developed a hinge, made it, yes. installed yes. it. Yes, and didn't even notice it. Mm. I know what you mean. I get that sometimes it's, it's rare. But uh, sometimes we get customers as well that are very ungrateful for the whole install and they get hung up on very tiny things. And I think it is hard to know from a customer perspective if you're not in the field of building these things because all you see, you just see the finished product. You've got no idea that we can't just grab things off the shelf really and just put a bit of glue on it, stick them in the car and, you know, jobs done but uh, in our industry we are building prototypes every time i know it's it's a prototype every time and if you think about that how other industries work they make a product they test it they test it here there then they install it a few times they go cool this is a finished product we're going to do this now and it's going to be the same every time obviously but what we do is we do prototyping. Yeah. We don't repeat really. It's this. It's not the same thing every time. So every time we have to think about how is this going to be installed? How are we going to solve this? It needs to be a special bracket for that. The cables have to be run differently. So I don't think there's a lot of industries in the world that do that much prototyping in such a short time. And I think a lot of customers are not aware of the service that they're actually getting. Because I walk into your, well, how often do I, visit you in your every couple of weeks i'll walk in yeah. there and uh and it's such an interesting place to be because you find you find lots of activity or lots of people were kind of working on their own and then there's a little huddle <laughs> and that little <laughs> huddle will move to a car yeah and then open and close and rattle things and bash things a bit and then and then the people will walk away and if yeah. it was a it was a time lapse <laughs> you'd have these little huddles kind of and then another one we call it mission brain trust oh okay so we've got this thing where we call in the brain trust so if somebody encounters a problem and goes like oh how are we going to solve this everybody's got uh got the right to call in the brain trust so everybody will stop come in we discuss the problem <laughs> all together we find a solution we keep yeah. going yeah no, it's, an it's usually the group that finds a good solution for everything. Yes, it's a, it's an, your, your place is always interesting. It's <laughs> always interesting. I poke my nose in and see what kind of vehicles you've got in there and a, mm. a good variety of vehicles and uh, the occasional camper trailer and things like that and big vehicles. and it's Usually troopies. There's usually a always a troopie. <laughs> a, lot of troop, a lot of troop carriers. Yeah. That is very, very true. 
but but all kinds of cars, lots of Prados and patrols and things like that. Yeah. For electrical wiring work. So you don't have any juicy juicy tales for me about. Not really, and to be quite honest, <laughs> even without <laughs> saying names to it, to me, I'm I'm very I'm very conscious about the you know. If it would be, it would have been a customer of mine, and I respect that. So no, I wouldn't no, even share the story. No, no. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps those stories are, are better for the campfire. But, but you don't yeah. act. But you don't have that many of them. I, I honestly, even now thinking about it, a really juicy story. Mm. I don't. I don't really know one. Mm. What your juicy stories are, though, you, you must admit, sometimes you'll come in. A vehicle will come in, and you will see some welding work or some construction work. And they're horror stories. Uh, we get a lot of, you know, the worst people, I can say that, the worst people to wire cars are 240 volt electricians, your house electricians. Okay. We get that from time to time when people come in and they say, hey, I bought a car from an electrician and he's done all the wiring himself. I just want to add something. And that's usually the alarm bells going off already. We're like, let's have a look at this first. And I've got the feeling that house electricians generally wire their cars the same way they wire a house. You know, where just throw cables through somewhere and you go like, yep, yeah, that will stay there for the next 50 years because the house doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really get hot. There's no moving parts anywhere. So we've, we've seen some really shocking installations, mainly by house electricians. Okay. It's very interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> that is interesting. Because every now and again, if I'm there, you'll say, come and look at this. And it's normally some welding. Uh, we've had some oh, welding horror, stories as well, yeah. Horrific welding. Yeah. I mean, truly terrible welding from reputable. I mean, that companies. was, I, I remember the one because that was a tray that was built specifically for a certain camper. camper. And the camper was supposed to sit on the tray, but the tray was too small. It was sitting on the back edge of the tray. That's right. And it was just, yeah. It was not built in a great way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Having you and I are business partners. Yeah, we are. With Egon. Egon business partners. Now, in my life, if somebody comes to me and says, I, I, I've, I've got this new business partner, I kind of immediately go, because business partnerships <laughs> work one tenth of the time. Yeah. This is working because I think this is working because there's no ego. They're, no, it's not a pissing parade. <laughs> we we're not trying to. What we try to do is make the best thing, not be the one who makes the best thing. Absolutely. And so as a result of that, we've been in business now, what, three and a half? Must be four years now. Yeah. Must be four years now. I think Since a big thing is also that we've got two completely different fields of expertise. expertise. You are the one who knows how to put things in scene and you have got the practical uh, background knowledge of how to apply the product and what they have to do in the field. I've got a, I've got. So a I'm the that. Steve Jobs, but I'm a nice guy. <laughs> yes, and you're already older, I think. <laughs> and you're the Wozniak. I'm the I'm the technical person in the background. Yeah, yeah. the the one who actually goes yes. like, okay, that is a great idea. Yeah. Let's, I'll make it. I'll, I'll I'll figure out how to make it. Yeah. You worry, about, yeah, no, absolutely. It's not altogether like that because, I mean, we do actually have a lot of ideas flow very, very freely. I think that's one of the secrets because we just bounce ideas off each other and there's this, there's an initial idea and it just goes, oh, and here's a, and we just add things to it and it yeah. might end up somewhere completely different, but it's yeah. an open conversation about it. That's what's it, great about it. it. It is, it is. What is fantastic though for Egon is that you are on the ground, you are on the coal face as it were, and you're saying this is what, by fitting, because you fit hundreds of them into vehicles, mm. and and if there's a comeback, we've had very few, few comebacks, but if there is one, you can actually look at it in detail and make a good judgment call. That's why we're now on version 2.01. 2.1. 2 2.1. So on the DC hub, because we tweak, ah, oh, okay, potential weakness. It's like, yeah, Let's we can tweak. still make that better. And it's we can so easy it for us to make it better yeah. really quickly. It is. And we get, we actually, like you said, we're directly boots on the ground. We see it every day because I think on average, I think we install two, at least probably two DC hubs a week, two, three DC hubs a week. Mm. That's in the workshop, in the bigger builds. That's mm. 
what happens there all the time. So yeah. we know how we have to apply the product. Yeah. And if there is something that needs updating, we usually know firsthand in the workshop. Yeah, you, you do. And the, um, there was the idea of uh, doing a smaller DC hub, which actually turned into the relay hub. Mm. Because you said, okay, well, we can do a smaller DC hub, that's a, but we need to give it something extra. How about the, re relieving the complicated idea of wiring up a relay, which is a pain in the ass, because I've done it so many times where you have to go, okay, that's the feed cable, and then that's the switch cable, which number is that? Okay, that's that one. And then you, you do all that stuff with a relay. If you don't do it every day, that's what you do. Yeah. We're here, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Follow the instructions. Done. <laughs> Five of them. So you then said, oh, no, we'll do a mini thing, but we'll, we'll make a relay. So, so then it actually became the relay hub. It is. And it's always born out of the necessity for what I see in the workshop where we go like, we need this thing because we got a problem that we have to solve in a complicated way every time. And what I do then is I do research and I go like, I want to buy a product because if there is a product, I don't want to design a product because it's a lot more complicated. It's a lot more. I'd rather get and go like, that's a great product, let's, let's use that. Because I don't have the ego to say, I have to make the product that I use in my shop. That's, that's unimportant for me. I just want to build a really good product for a customer. But if the thing that makes it better doesn't exist, and I go like, well, <clears throat> I suppose we have to make it ourselves so we can actually deliver a better end result for the customer. And the, the Relay Hub is one of these things where We've always got multi-core cables coming together in one point, which is usually a multi-core cable from the roof, from the front where switches are, from another location where switches are. There's power supplies coming in. And all of that then needs to be put together in the right way to allow the switches turning the lights on, the power supplies coming. And then we designed the Relay Hub to take care of all of that. The Relay Hub is basically an interface where all these multi-core cables attach to and you're done. And it's clean. Yeah, and it's powered by one cable from the DC Hub. <laughs> Rather than plenty of cables. Mm. So, yeah, that's how that got born. It's usually the, all the Egan products are things where we went, we've got a problem, we want to solve it somehow, we want to solve it in the best possible way. And at the end, we had a product and went... Well, if it works fast in the workshop, we might as well sell it to other people as well. It's been one of the biggest problems with e marketing Egon is that we're, we're, we're saying, here's a new butter knife. People are saying, well, we're quite happy with our butter knife. And, I, and we're saying, well, wouldn't you like to spread 10, 10 in the price <laughs> yeah, of right. in the same time as you had spread one? Yeah. Uh, well, how is that even possible? Well, it is. And it, it's been our it's been a challenge. It's a big challenge. I think another big challenge is that in the industry we're in, a lot of people only want to install what they make themselves. They're not really interested in products that are being made by their competition. So a lot of our forward drive industry is where people have got really big egos and just want to do what they think is right. And there's no or there, there is, there's not a lot of collaboration in between companies, which I find frustrating sometimes because I always think that teamwork is what brings businesses, people, countries in general, any, any mm. amount mm. of people mm. the furthest. If, yeah. you, if you try to work against each other, it takes up way too much energy trying to be in conflict with another company, another person, rather than working together with everybody. Let's move away from Egon for a moment. Mm. Your love. This, this has turned a bit into advertising, right? Yeah, well, well, what the hell? Yeah. What the hell? We've got a really good story that I'm going to present on the main Forex Overland channel. And that is about, it's a good news story. It's a bad news story turned into a good news story. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So your Hilux, your lovely Hilux that... The unbreakable car. The unbreakable car that kept breaking on the Canning Stock route. <laughs> yeah. Broke even more. Broke even more. <laughs> Tell us briefly about uh, about that story. So what I didn't realize back in then was my fuel consumption was getting worse and worse. And there is actually a fault that Toyota knows about with those three liter D4D engines that injectors are overfueling and eventually they destroy the engine. So what happened with mine is one piston number four split clean in the middle. 
and I lost compression immediately. The dipstick shot out of the engine, engine oil sprayed through the engine bay. You know, I could just feel the engine starting to shake on the way home from a camping trip. I pulled over, I had a look under the bonnet and I knew that is it. If the dip sticks out and engine oil has sprayed around, you know that there's a problem. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I was in for very... Did you cross yourself? No, <laughs> I didn't. But I said, oh shit. Because <laughs> Rina asked from the car, how bad is it? And I think I said, it's the end. <laughs> oh dear. So, but then somebody told me that there is uh, uh, an official warranty claim that can be made to Toyota with these engines if they haven't got more than 250,000 kilometers on them. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to try that. And uh, brought it to Toyota dealership. They inspected it and they said like, yep, it's a problem with the overfueling. It's a known issue. And uh, they handed in the claim and Toyota said, yep, we're going to send you a new engine. And that's How old is your car? Nine, nine years. So it's, nine years and 230,000 kilometers and Toyota said that they would, even though the car is well out of its warranty period. Well out of its warranty period. They said that they would fix yeah. it. They, they wouldn't pay for everything. They uh, sent a new short engine. They sent new injectors and a few other parts. Everything that had to do with the fault and the things that were broken. I still had to pay for a remanufactured cylinder head and for the labor to change everything. But the parts, they send for free. That's pretty amazing. That is, because I, I have not thought that would happen. I have a go at Toyota often about their warranty issues, mm. and I don't take it all back. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to share a good story with a bad story. Yeah, that so is a very good story. I was very surprised story. when they told me Toyota said yes, the parts are coming. I was like, wow. I would have not expected that from any other vehicle manufacturer. No. I would have not expected that from any vehicle yeah. manufacturer. We are going to, I'm doing a full story on that because mm. it's actually, there's actually quite a lot of detail in the story that is actually worth sharing yeah. on the where and wow and how and and subsequent events because you haven't had your car now for six months and you still don't have four. it. Four, yeah. Is it four months? Yeah. yeah. You still don't have it. No. So that's been a bit of a frustration of actually getting it, getting it fixed. Yeah. yeah. That's a different story though. We'll, we'll, nothing we'll, to do with the engine itself. <laughs> no, nothing to do with the engine itself. So, so we'll get to that story. That'll probably be a feature on... I'll probably do a story on it because mm. I like I like good news stories, yeah. as well as uh, stirring the pot, yeah. <laughs> which has been very very easy these recent days with various cars yeah. and everything. Uh, do you have any trips planned? Big trips planned? There is one I've got planned with you for a secret project that nobody knows about yet. Our secret project. Our secret project. Yeah. I would still love to travel through the Kalahari, but you know. We, we need somebody to give us about $200,000 probably for that, I think. Yeah. To, to let you know, we, 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 sh we basically decided, you know, French Cross the Canning. And we're going to get all the canningers here in the studio. We're going to do a, a podcast with us because well, it's a little over a year since we did it. Yeah. It was still one of the greatest things we've all ind individually ever done, I mean, even for me. And I've done a lot of this. It's still one of those highlights. It, it's Same fan, for me. It was fantastic. And I still watch the episodes from time to time. Yes. Like, oh, so, so was... Everybody has a copies of all the videos so they can. I know John watches them and shows it yeah. to his folks and that. We wanted to do another one. And the idea was that we would do... The Kalahari. Uh, Friends Cross the Kalahari. And it would be my job as the only sensible one in the group to stop you guys being eaten. Because I know a little bit about you know, surviving in the African bush and you guys are idiots. Yeah, but that would be the. But we would need about. Two, we we actually budgeted it. I actually budgeted it, and to do that, we would need uh, between one hundred and eighty and two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and if so, that is possible, <clears throat> and we get that. I'll get Rob so drunk that we get him to dry humble lion somewhere in the desert. <laughs> no, 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 you won't. <laughs> no, no, this is the point. You won't. <laughs> potato, potato. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. Look, it could be very, very funny. It could also be very tragic. It, yeah, it could well, be. What the hell, we'll just do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that is the goal. Anybody, any donors? It's a long shot. Honestly, mm. it's a long shot. For, 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 
for the kind of audience we have and the size of audience and the fact that we would be producing it for YouTube, not a television a network, a streaming network, anybody like that. And we would again, like we've done it before, not have a great big television crew because you have to, I mean, on canning, it looks at times like we had a crew because it's quite polished. It's only polished in the editing and the shooting is not polished at all. Not at all. It, no, it's not polished at all. And it's... A lot of the best scenes weren't even on camera. They were because they were just missed because we didn't have anybody filming it. Nobody that time. was filming it. Yeah, mm. we would have to do the same again because the moment you bring a camera crew into that environment, you change the dynamic. Yeah, but we could at least have more cameras because we, we didn't would, even have enough cameras. <laughs> we didn't have enough cameras. We would all we would each have a camera, and we would it, it, there would be. It would be better, and I think it would be a lot funnier. I think it would be. But YouTube with a channel my size doesn't, it just doesn't. You need a million plus subs to even start thinking about that yeah. kind of, that kind of um, programming. So anybody, anybody wants to. Yeah. yeah, maybe Netflix can give you a call. Netflix, let me explain to you about Netflix. They don't call any, <laughs> they don't call anybody. All they do is they contact their agents, their known established agents, and they say, these are the programs we're looking for. And yeah. that's it. That's all they do. They don't, you know, they don't take any, in fact, no streaming network really, not entirely true, but it's very difficult to find a streaming network that will take unsolicited presentations, ideas. And the reason for that is that if they have, they might say, well, we had that idea anyway, and then they get sued for stealing somebody else's idea. So what do they do? So we're not interested. We're not interested. That's the way they handle it. Right. We're not interested in your idea. That's how they start the negotiations. So you have to use an agency and the agency will then present an idea to the streaming networks. And it's been like that for donkey's years. Even with the Discovery Channel, I, 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 I had dealings with the Discovery Channel and uh, managed to get somewhere with them and had some of my shows broadcast on Discovery Channel. It was tough. It was tough. And there was not a lot of money in it. So anyway, that's yeah. what we're going to try and But do. that would be a great trip. That would be fantastic. But we are going to be doing something in Australia next year. Mm. Uh, in fact, we might even do something later this year because to wrap up, we're doing something with my troop carrier. Oh, we have to test that as well. Yes, I forgot about that. So I had, and I may have mentioned it on my solo trip, which is being rolled out now on YouTube. We, I had promised when we did the installation of the interior that I was developing a, a, a kit that could be sold separately and shipped. And because Rob changed his the company that he was working with and that structure changed and their product line changed, that was never forthcoming. Now you and I have sat and designed and Johnny have sat and designed a, a new interior uh, because my current interior in my troop carrier has some shortcomings. I wanted to address that, mainly packing space, mm. mainly packing space. Address that and also the weight, it was heavy. And so we are about to fit your new system, which you are marketing and selling. Yes. I'm getting the prototype. Yeah. And you've got to be the guinea pig. For I'm so going to be the guinea pig. Test how it's going to be. I'm going to be the <laughs> guinea pig and we'll do the installation. The great part about it is the electrical installation can be done outside the car. Yes. So literally put wired up, slid into the back of the troop carrier, attached, multi-core cables, done. Well, the system for it is that we can build this troopy kit here in Perth with everything, including the plumbing, the batteries, everything installed. Then the system can be split apart into four pieces, five, including the control piece. And... Uh, put into a crate, including a floor and everything, and shipped anywhere in the world, and then be installed by whoever receives it in a very easy fashion. All the hard bit is done. So the idea of that is that we can't just install troopy interiors here in Perth. We can actually make troopy interiors for anybody anywhere who is in need of a really cool interior, because face it, there are a lot of places in the world where people like troopies, but there isn't an industry like there is here in Perth where people can get interiors fitted. We've got 
we've got multiple companies that Several do, do yeah. very nice jobs. And really, really nice jobs, but yeah. none actually have a kit where you can say like, hey, we can fit it out and send it out. I've, mm -hmm. I've tried to work together with, I think most of them, in a way that we changed the design, but it was always too complicated because to integrate the electrics and the plumbing in a kit that is already there is not easy. You have to go back and forth how it works and split it up and everything. And well, yours will be a bit like that. It'll be the prototype yeah. for it. Yeah. So I'm sticking with all of the good parts that I have existing and correcting those few shortcomings. And it's going to be better. Mm. It is going to be better. And we're doing something unique with the water tanks. So those water tanks are actually on their way from South Africa now. And the reason why they're coming from South Africa is because nobody in the world is doing this with trippy water tanks. I'm actually really looking for, forward to people. That is a cool Very, idea very cool. It. Very, very cool. So that's going to be part of the, and it'll be on the main Forex Overland channel. Mm. Something quite revolutionary. And the idea for which will be perfect for our new project. The secret project. The secret project. <laughs> <laughs> that concept. Yes. So, yeah, we're, we're basically practicing. That, that concept. So we're yeah. practicing. So I'm again the guinea pig and the guy that I'm being practiced on. You enjoy that, right? I enjoy it. I love it. <laughs> absolutely, I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. No, I really do. I really do love it. And whether I keep my, the 2.8, because now I've ordered a 2.8 troop carrier as well, mm. You have your own misgivings about the 2.8 engine in a vehicle like Troop Carrier. I'm not sure. It's like I really think it is something that needs to be tested. I think once you load a vehicle up and it gets really heavy, I think the 2.8 will reveal its weaknesses. I think for the vehicle being relatively empty, it'll be brilliant. But I might be wrong. But it's that. not going to be relatively empty. It's going to be close to GVM. Yeah, and for a lot of people it will be over more. GVM. I think that's where the 2.8 will start to struggle. And I think that's where people go, I wish I had the 4.5 litre V8 in it. Especially when you put a little chip tune in it as well, like you do with the, with the Torquid system. Then you get power out of the V8. That oh, it's is fantastic. The way it needs to that's be in a heavy vehicle. Absolutely fantastic. It is brilliant. But it is to be seen. I mean, a 2.8 litre four-cylinder... It can still develop a lot of power and engine technology has come a really long way so I I think it's good that you got one or got one on order so we can actually see how this thing is gonna behave when it's heavy okay all right we can test it first just by loading a lot of rocks into the back <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just yeah I don't think we're gonna have fun with it though yeah because what I my idea then is with the four point with a 2.8 is to actually purchase one of your interior products and install it here in my home mm. see how easy it is so again guinea pig number two yeah i'll you know what it's forklift to... to unload it no that's okay well the problem is let's find out if that's necessary mm. because we need to actually have a prototype so you're going to have i'm guinea pig again and i will actually physically build it myself in my own workshop as if i was a customer yeah because then I'm going to phone you and say, you know something, you need to add this because mm. I'm struggling with this. And what a great way of learning how, to, how people will... That is very true. I'm reasonably practically minded, but I'm no genius in the workshop. So I'm probably the ideal candidate. You'd be quite good for that, yeah. Yeah. Just hold on. Not, not too good. No, not too good. <laughs> it will be funny watching you. He's <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, right. Heiner has his own YouTube channel. Yes, I do. You do, and it's called Ready to Drive Anywhere. It is, and, and he's very annoying about it because wherever we go, he's always got these patches <laughs> and he sticks them everywhere, and hands people coolies whether they like it or not, and annoys a, you annoy a lot of people. Yeah, I do. You do. Yeah. Yes. But I know that. Check it out. Ready to drive anywhere. It's. Good. Thanks. I, I no, didn't no, even wear a shirt today. You, you didn't. I came camouflaged. I, I, I haven't even got nothing. Can't believe it. Yeah, I, I know. cannot believe it. It's very out of character for you to not be wearing a, a, a even at least a cap. Yeah, 
when I'm on when you're doing media anyway so (laughs) it's and um, there's lots of fun installations a lot of a lot of electrical installations and uh, quite a bit of teaching yeah there's tips and tricks advice product reviews so it's it's all about auto electric and auto electrical installations it's good stuff it's good solid solid yeah. It's typical YouTube stuff, but it's a little bit more advanced than a lot of YouTube stuff in terms of the electrical stuff. A lot of insights into it. It is. It's a bit, I would say it's a YouTube channel for auto electric and overlanding nerds. Oh, okay. All right. And of like course, us. And of course exactly, we, are, we, are, we are our own best customers. <laughs> Heiner teaches on the Overland Workshop. That's overland-workshop.com. And your course is all about... It's, I, I, it is brilliant. I think it is an outstanding course, and I'm not just saying that to blow smoke. Mm. The way you teach, you have to be a complete moron not to understand it. And yet it's actually quite in-depth and, and uh, how to install and, de- and in your own DC electrical system in your vehicle. Now, I think if you take the time to look through that workshop that you've got there, and you follow it step by step and you use the paper, uh, you can learn how to do all of that. It's it, All the information is there. You just got to take your time, maybe repeat things once or twice, but you'll definitely get that. It's all the yeah. information to yeah. install something yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Hannah. That's actually been good fun. Same. Good fun. I hope you I hope everybody has enjoyed watching it, stroke listening to it. And uh, I've, I've got a complaint, though. That this, this is empty now. And there's... There's nothing else. (laughs) All right, we'll get to it. We'll go and find another beer. I know I've got some somewhere and we'll go and relax. Thank you, everybody, for listening, straight watching. Until next Sunday, the next Journey podcast. See you then. Say goodbye to the camera. Goodbye to the camera. (laughs) Say that again. Goodbye, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) thank you so much for listening to the next adventure podcast with me andrew st pierre white to find out more information check out the next journey.net join us each sunday 